you know, that's part of what I think is really fun about writing the articles that I've been writing is that um, I feel like I've been given a lot of um, freedom to wonder about something and say, is this real? Is this true? Is this interest? Is this going to bring me into an interesting place and explore it? And then explore it enough where I can put out a fully fledged overview of this little pocket of history or science or this with the cat divorces, this cultural manifestation of something that was happening. And it's not something that is always out there. A lot of the time it's lost and it's fleeting. And now we don't have, say, cat divorces, for example. Uh, or if we do, it's probably very rare because you can just get a divorce because you don't want to be together anymore in most places. And looking back at that kind of gives us a little bit of a lens on who we were as a culture or who um, was living in this time and how they had to deal with it. And right now we have repercussions like meat raffles and, you know, with groom's cakes where it's maybe was born out of a deeply held tradition or a time of strife, but now it's kind of an entertaining leftover that we get to keep to not have too much of a pun with the cakes and the and the meat and leftovers. So you were listening to Natalie Zarelli, who is a contributor to the awesome website atlasobscura.com. She's also been on this show before to tell us about her amazing time as part of a sideshow. But for this episode, I selected three of Natalie's recent pieces for the Atlas to discuss And based on what Natalie just said to you, you'll probably be able to guess we'll be talking about meat raffles, broom cakes, and cat divorces. So let's jump right into the meat raffles. During World War II, there was a battle on the home front, too. The tussle with ration books, tokens, and stamps. Supplies were short, and everything from shoes to gasoline was doled out. No stamps, no soap. Every cut of meat carried a certain point value, and many times stamps were more valuable than money. And rationing proved that the American people had vivid imaginations. The Office of Price Administration was swamped with fantastic tales from people who claimed they faced disaster without an extra allotment of this or that. Headaches were many, housewives had a problem keeping track of stamps, and businessmen sought clerks and other help in vain. Pity the poor storekeeper when it came time. Yeah, do you guys have meat raffles in Montreal? Is that something that exists? I think it could be more like a, a like a, maybe a, an American or a British thing. So in Montreal, maybe it's the French. They, we don't really do meat raffles. Yeah, yeah. They um they did originate. It seems in uh in England, World War Two was is I guess it pops up the most, but they're basically that was out of rationing. So what happened was families were, you know, very rationed in what they could eat and they they had meat rations. And sometimes maybe it was partly for fun and partly just for the gamble of seeing if you could feed your whole family on the rations that were given to you instead of everyone having such a small amount to eat. Um, they would get together and put their meat in and kind of raffle off these numbers and whoever won got to bring the whole pot home or got to bring their choice of meat home with them. And that evolved. And in the kind of, it's a little unknown exactly how it came to the United States, if it kind of popped up at the same time without much contact or if it was really brought home by soldiers, um, and it may have been. But in the Midwest and meaning uh, in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, and in western New York also, there's a little holdout. Um, It became very popular. And uh, I actually found out about them because a friend of mine who lives in Minnesota just asked everybody in her uh, Facebook friend feed, is this a Minnesota thing? Are there meat raffles anywhere else? And I had never heard of them before. And I ended up researching it and 
talking to a lot of great people at bars and VFWs in the Midwest and also in um, New York, in western New York near Buffalo. And a lot of the time it's mostly people in VFWs, mostly an older crowd. Um, you kind of, it's almost secret. People kind of don't always learn about it until their grandfather tells them about it. And then they go, ooh, and then, you know, at some point they attend. But it's starting to become even kind of like a bar trend in um, Minnesota, especially. So sort of the young crowd is going now to meat raffles. <laughs> You said that it's a it's a meat raffle. I, I mean, how does that work? Like, it, so everyone just brings a bunch of meat to the bar, and then there's like just a big old wheel or something that people spin, or is it like a bingo thing where people pull out numbers? Yeah, so that's the modern twist on it. Instead of people bringing their own meat to the meat raffle the way they had during ration times um, in England, it is actually a not. A sort of a nonprofit takes control a lot of the time of the what meat they acquire and sort of runs the show at the bar, which is usually a dive bar, um, or at the VFW. And the nonprofit um, the, will organize that the proceeds go to a charity, usually in consort with the VFW or with the bar to see which charity they would like to donate all of the proceeds to the meat raffle. So it's a charity event. Um, it could be for a hockey team. It could be for, you know, Girl Scouts. Um, it could be for some other cause that is important, like a school. Uh, and so what happens is the nonprofit um, or whoever is organizing with the nonprofit finds a local butcher who makes really or puts out really good meat for sale. And so the draw is that these, this is really high quality meat that you would usually pay like a fair amount of money for because it's, you know, local and, you know, locally sourced. It's, it's kind of supposed to be a deal for it's fresh, you know, good, fresh very butcher fresh. meat. Exactly. And so that's the draw for people to attend is that you have, that and then also it's a lot of fun people are drinking the whole time um and also when you attend all you have to do is buy a one dollar to be part of this whole night and they usually have a wheel i guess the best ones have a wheel is what um people um who go to meet raffles tell me and the wheel will spin it usually will have 30 um sort of numbers on it and, you know, lands on a number and the person who wins with their ticket gets to go up to a big table with a selection of different cuts of meat. It could be, you know, anywhere from a pound to five pounds of sausage or it could be, um, depending on the season, you know, Thanksgiving in the United States is in November. So in November, they might have a whole turkey, you know, for raffle in the pool. And that's a big draw because turkeys can be fairly expensive here. Yeah. And then you could take care of your whole turkey dinner. And if you buy a bunch of tickets throughout the night, you could win multiple times. And if you actually win too much in one night, there I'm told that there's a little bit of resentment sometimes and you're called the meat hog. <laughs> <laughs> it, this reminds me. Did you did you ever watch this uh, this movie called UHF with Weird Al Yankovic in it? Yeah, I had. <laughs> so it reminds me of the know. Wheel of Fish. I wonder if that was um, I, you know, maybe that was a reference I didn't get at the time. Weird Al, he actually has a lot of references to places like, for instance, the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. Right. So um, I don't. I think he grew up in California, but he has a lot of references to Midwest. I don't know 100%, but it's interesting that he has this wheel of fish, and uh, they, they spin the wheel of fish, and uh, Cooney, who's the, I think his name's Cooney, I can't believe I know this. Yeah, they, he had the wheel of fish, and that it, what instantly brought me to that. So, when did you turn 15? October 5th, 1998. On February 14th, 1994. October 29th, 2002. November 17th, 1983. May 21st, 1998. 
It's the Songs That Saved Your Life, an interview show that explores who we were at age 15 through the music that got us through our awkward years. Each week, my guest will present and discuss three songs that they most identified with at that age and the stories behind them. It's kind of like if your sophomore year had a soundtrack. Subscribe at eartrumpetaudio.com or wherever you find your podcasts. Um, we also have uh, another story that you did um, all about groom's cakes, which these are, so during the, the wedding, during a wedding, um, it's a lovely tradition because it's not all about the bride in this case. Uh, the, the, the groom, um, I guess in the case of a heterosexual wedding, that is, uh, the groom mm-hmm. gets to choose a cake and that would be his cake and he gets to have it themed any, any which way he wants within probably some reason. Yeah, it's nice. It's it's actually also a tradition that comes from very strange uh, wedding traditions in England. And um, I thought that was really fun to read about myself because the wedding cake on its own uh, didn't, you know, it wasn't always in existence in, in weddings in Europe even. And um, when cakes started to become more decorative, when icing was sort of invented, um, People had already been using this really kind of dry cake to perform a ritual at the wedding where they would actually sprinkle crumbs of the cake over the bride's head for good luck. And icing came into play. People started making elaborate, beautiful cakes. And they found that the icing was even better because it made sure that the crumbs stuck. (laughs) And... (laughs) But as icing evolved and as cakes became more elaborate, they didn't want to use the wedding cake for that anymore. So they started using this kind of dry fruit cake that they would ice lightly on the side. And they would sprinkle some of that over the bride's head. But they would also give um, pieces of it away to especially the groom's men, um, sort of as a wedding gift. And it became a tradition. That evolved. And... Um, It evolved in England, and then it came over to the United States. And there was a time where, in a lot of places in the United States, a groom's cake was common. And it would usually be a smaller cake on the side that was maybe pretty, um, but it was also something that you would give to guests um, and that you would, you know, give to the groom's men and the bridesmaids as kind of a special, this is your cake. Um, And people would even, uh, they were little bits of wedding lore surrounding the groom's cake. If you were um, a woman and you got a piece of groom's cake and brought it home, if you slept with it under your pillow, then you might dream of the person that you're going to marry and that sort of thing. And it just went wild after that. People started making groom's cakes crazier and crazier. Now, um, groom's cakes could not be normally cut up into cubes and put under a pillow for someone to sleep under. Sometimes they are huge, you know, replicas of R2-D2 or... It's funny how that um, works. Yeah. I, I saw Nintendo controllers. I saw this giant, like, I guess, stag, like this huge deer type thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that cake and uh, 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 football helmets, everything. And... And based on what I read here, you said that this was sort of common in North America up to around the 40s. And then after that, it sort of now it's prevalent in the South. Yeah. In the in the southern United States, um, it's still a, in a lot of places. It's a given that you're going to have a groom's cake. And I interviewed um, actually a couple of friends of mine who live in New Orleans, where I used to live, who... I knew had been married and that were from there and asked them if they had had a groom's cake. And they went, of course we did. And, um, you know, one of them, uh, my friend Joshua, uh, really liked the game go. And so he decided to have his groom's cake be this really particular game of go that's famous called the ear reddening game. And, um, you know, they got it made at a local bakery and it is just a little, facsimile of a board game, you know, on a cake. And 
it was just kind of a fun way for him to participate in this and for it to be a special sort of the groom's personalities gets to gets to come through with this kind of special involvement in the wedding. The state of Florida ranked second in the race to cynically put asunder by law what the law had supposedly joined together forever. In Texas, one county in 1945 so far surpassed the national ratio of one failure out of every five marriages that it balanced almost every wedding with a divorce. Even South Carolina, which allows no divorce at all, found over 5,100 divorcees on its last census. What is causing one-time suitors in love to become suitors before the law? In the courtroom, you'd hear everything from cruelty to infidelity. But these are just the legal reasons. What about the hidden reasons for today's divorce? And, I mean, another thing that you wrote about recently that I found really super interesting I mean, after the wedding's all said and done, of course, we can talk about divorce. Right. <laughs> well, that's a little, <laughs> that's a little uh, cynical. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, 50% is, is what we're at, so I've heard. Um, but back in the 20s and, and even the 30s, um, there was a situation where it was cats. Uh, there, was a, there was a tie between cats and divorce in the United States. Yeah. So, and that was really interesting um, to find out too. Basically, I, I even just found out about this because sometimes I just look through old newspapers and newspaper archives online. And I kind of was just having fun with it on my own, not necessarily thinking I was going to find an article in it. But I searched for cat and for some reason I searched for divorce along with cat as search terms in this online news archive. And I was so surprised that many articles from around the country, and apparently this is actually something that happened around um, diff many countries, um, there were little articles that talked about people's marriages ending because of cats. And I went, what? <laughs> Why? And there all fairly serious. A lot of sometimes it's, you know, the one of the people in the marriage had too many pet cats, um, and sometimes it's just that um, it. The ones I've read, it tended to be the husband was upset. The last straw was that the cat wouldn't stop sleeping on his favorite chair. So, <laughs> <laughs> and one one man thought that his wife loved the cats more than she loved him. So they went to petition for a divorce. And what I found was, at the time, you couldn't get a divorce just based on unhappiness. There had to be somebody at fault. And you had to have a reason why you couldn't make it work. And it had to be beyond your control if you were asking for the divorce. It couldn't just be that you fell out of love. You were expected to make it work unless undue cruelty um, could you know, explain why somebody shouldn't be married to you anymore. And a lot of people, when it turned out they were having other marital problems, maybe they weren't communicating, maybe they weren't in love anymore, they had to figure something out. And sometimes that something were the cats. <laughs> so do you think this was primarily like a guy thing? Or do you think that uh, in some cases the, the woman also decided to, to blame the cat? It's likely that sometimes women decided to blame the cat. Um, there were times, the ones that I found where women were the ones asking for the divorce, it was that the husband stepped on the cat's tail uh. or the husband, one husband, um, threw a cat at his wife and she thought that was the last straw. Another husband in Salem, Massachusetts actually locked a cat in a freezer. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty ghastly. And didn't kill it, but, you know, I don't know why he, the, it doesn't go into why even he did that. Not that that's excusable anyway, but, um, that was definitely the impetus for his wife saying, I am not going to be with this person anymore. These days that would get you probably criminal like charges if you were Absolutely. to lock a, an animal up in a freezer like that. But 
I guess I guess part of the story that you brought out was that attitudes towards cats were a bit different back then. So they were still not really seen as being indoor pets. They weren't. It was very new. It wasn't um, until, you know, the turn of the 20th century that people ever thought of cats really or around the turn of the 20th century, the 1880s. That's the first time in England where um, cats started to become um, sort of an animal you wanted to keep so that you could show your cat. The cat shows started existing. Um, People started advocating for the treatment of cats and sort of keeping them at home as a pet. And that did spread. And it spread in the United States around the same time that all these cat divorces start popping up. So before that, cats were just seen as these mangy flea-ridden creatures on the street that ate rats and you might keep them around so that they can control pests for you but you don't let them inside and they're dirty and you know there's also this whole history culturally in western culture anyway of cats being a little bit evil a little bit you know there's cats and witches there's they're not seen as these cuddly lovely creatures that everyone's obsessed with now so i'm more of a dog person myself And uh, the thing with cats is that, in my experience, um, they'll 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 love you, but only on their terms. Ever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So with a with a dog, you pet the dog. The dog's happy, very simple minded kind of, you know, happiness that they have. uh, You know, very nice, intelligent, but just a different kind of happiness. Well, with cats, sometimes, I mean, I wonder if. My cat was bipolar, actually. It just <laughs> one it would just jump from being affectionate to I'm going to rip your face off now. But mm-hmm. um I mean I could see that. And I mean, I guess every street has its I mean, when I was growing up, there all every neighborhood that I lived in seemed to always have a, a cat lady. Right. <laughs> that would be the cat it would be the lady who has twenty cats. So yeah. I I can kind of see where that 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 is going. I mean, like if if you're with someone and she has or he has 15 cats, that can get outrageous. Yeah, and there were some of these um news articles had claims that some of these couples owned let's see, there was this man um in California who won a divorce Let's see, it says uh, extreme cruelty because his wife loves cats brought his divorce. And his wife, Florence, kept as many as 50 cats around the house and they upset him, is what the article says. And that's a lot of cats. I I would be upset (laughs) too. So maybe maybe some of it is is warranted. I mean, the whole no-fault divorce thing, I mean, came in and that ushered in a new era where you could just be upset and you you don't have to come up with excuses um, yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, it, it was an interesting, like, liaison. I mean, why cats? I mean, why not dogs? I don't know what the situation was with dogs back then, if they kept dogs in the house or if they just kept them tied up outside. I should, uh, look a little more into that. I do know people did keep dogs and had kept dogs. You know, even wealthier people would have dogs on their estate and would occasionally let the dog inside, um... And so people seemed to keep dogs more often than they kept, um, you know, it, they would keep dogs and had throughout time and they were seen as kind of a companion to man where cats were this, you know, this outside dirty animal that you didn't really keep around like it was a weasel. But at the same time, it's when you look at these articles, they're definitely masking something. Even that woman who supposedly had 50 cats, I mean, she did testify that she had 15 cats and three dogs, but that the real problem was that her husband didn't come home at night. So maybe he wasn't, maybe things weren't going so well. Maybe and that's why she got so many cats. Maybe. She needed somebody to, to talk to. <laughs> 15 so, cats equals one husband, maybe. <laughs> are, are, you more of a, are you more of a cat person or a dog person? I really love them both. I grew up with cats and um, with a dog. And um, I used to have a cat who now actually lives with my sister um, because I got a traveling job at at one point and couldn't bring my cat with me. And right now I have a dog. 
um, named Sasquatch. And I love, I like them both. I think they're both such different types of creatures to interact with, you know, and it's true that cats seem to bring their own terms to the table, but at the same time, you know, they also do a lot of the time like attention. It's just a very different kind of attention, I think. Like dogs learn more what you want and try, I think, to accommodate that a lot more often where cats tend to learn, you know, what they like about their interaction with you. What I love about this is that um, reading the stories in Alice Obscura is sometimes I, I have to pinch myself to say it, it, this is really true. And it's such a it's such an odd little like little odd um, capsules of history, mm-hmm. so it's not the kind of history where it's like oh and then you know the tanks moved into Normandy blah blah blah. This is like everyday life, and if you were to talk to someone back then, they would have said oh yeah meat raffles. It's like we do that every Saturday night, what have you, or stag cakes, what have you. Whereas um, you know these days, at least in in certain many parts of, of the U.S. and Canada, I mean, these these things are are kind of lost, as you say, and it, it's kind of it's really fascinating to see how, I guess how it, it, it's like it colors in the 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 history. So you've got history, and then you color it in, or Atlas Obscura, you've got these like very idiosyncratic, eccentric. You have very eccentric like parts of history or parts of geography that, um, you know, uh, are, are, are fascinating. Yeah. And then, you know, and then sometimes, um, you find out, you know, people are, you know, for example, with meat raffles, there are places I'm sure in Canada where meat raffles exist, especially with like the English influence. There are parts of other parts of the States that have meat raffles, but they're not as, you know, they might not be as pronounced or as big, but it even more shows, this kind of as a quiet enjoyment of something that has been for such a long time. And you just wouldn't know about it necessarily if you weren't in it. And having a little peek into that is kind of is neat, whether it's current or history. So thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's always wonderful to talk to you. Well, that's about it for this episode. I'd like to thank Natalie for coming back on the show and would like to remind you all to check out her stuff at Atlas Obscura or on her website, nataliezarelli.com. I'll be providing links in the show notes. If you would like to listen to previous episodes of this show, please go to sharesliceplodcast.com. You can also subscribe to this show on iTunes or pretty much any other podcast platform out there. Speaking of iTunes... If you could leave us a five-star rating or review, it would go a long, long way. So please consider doing this. Introduction and ending music is provided with permission by Chromatics Music, and you can find them on SoundCloud. So thanks so much for listening, and I hope you'll be back next time.